I'm doing today. Yeah. Much better. Uh, thank you all for joining us here on the steps of the Supreme Court as we make it clear that South Carolinians and Southerners will not stand idly on the sidelines when legislators racially gerrymander voting maps to destroy the black power of black voters. As the justices hear the arguments today in Alexander v. South Carolina NAACP, we also want them to hear our call out here. Fair maps now. We know the politicians will claim this is about political parties, Democrat versus Republican, but we also know that that is a smokescreen. This is about racism. This is about historical discrimination against black South Carolinians. These maps, this gerrymander, it is immoral, it is unethical, and we are confident that the court will find it unconstitutional. Today, we are going to hear from advocates and activists from South Carolina and beyond speaking about the real effects of gerrymandering. First, I want to welcome to the stage singer Emma Brooks to come up and center our work today with a bit of music. Hello, everybody. Hello. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm not the temptation, but I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Lift every voice and sing. Tell earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoices rise high as the lift. Let us rejoice loud as a roll and sing. Sing a song full of the hope that the dark path has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the presence has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day, be God. Let us march on till victory has won. Right. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much, Ms. Brooks. <laughs> Now, to start off our rally today, I want to welcome to the stage uh, a South Carolina activist, founder of the International African American Museum, and congressional candidate in District 1. Everyone, please help me welcome Michael B. Moore. Good morning. Good morning. Today marks the beginning of oral arguments before the Supreme Court in the racial gerrymandering case for South Carolina's first congressional district. This is the district I call home, and it's the district that my team and I are working so hard to represent in Congress. As I stand here today outside our nation's highest court, I'm deeply moved by the legacy of my great-great-grandfather. His name was Robert Smalls. He was a towering figure in the South Carolina low country and uh, during the Reconstruction era. I'm so deeply honored and proud to be vying to serve for the very same seat that he served in back almost 150 years ago. After seizing his freedom in Charleston Harbor, Smalls emerged as a beacon of hope. He became the first African-American to command a United States Naval vessel during the Civil War. He served in both houses of the South Carolina legislature where, among other things, he wrote the legislation to create the first free compulsory statewide public school system in the entire nation. Robert Smalls went on to serve five terms in Congress in the United States House of Representatives, but in 1884, his district was gerrymandered by extreme politicians who sought to mute his influence and silence the voices of those he represented. Sound familiar? Now in 2023, I find myself here on the steps of the Supreme Court, fervently advocating 
for the voting rights of roughly 30,000 Low Country residents, many of whom likely are descended from the people that my great great grandfather served back in the day. Yet again, these communities have been unjustly deprived of their voice in Congress. Their voting power has been significantly, meaningfully diluted, and their rightful impact on our democracy has been unconstitutionally diminished. I want to read that again. Yet again, these communities have been unjustly deprived of their voice in Congress, their voting power has been significantly diluted, and their rightful impact on our democracy has been unconstitutionally diminished. While 1884 may seem like a long time ago, the same cynical tactics endure in 2023, marginalizing one block of voters for another simply to maintain unearned political power by whatever means necessary. Democracy is a torch that we all must bear, not an entitlement that we can passively take for granted. It's a stain on our American character when we trade our nation's bedrock principles for unjust partisan gain. A federal court has ruled that 30,000 votes were unconstitutionally gerrymandered in South Carolina's first congressional district. These 30,000 voters lost their political agency and their voice in the people's house. One person, one vote is the cornerstone of our national creed. When we forsake this principle, it's a moral failure, unbecoming of us as Americans. That's why over the course of my campaign, I'm committed to not only fighting against gerrymandering, but also working to ensure that every eligible citizen's voice is heard through robust voter registration efforts. We'll work tirelessly to empower communities with the knowledge and the resources they need to exercise their vote. The state's legislature's gerrymandering of our district has been contemned, condemned as a disgraceful act, a bleaching of black votes. Voters of black voters from our district and a mockery of our cherished democratic principles. It's simply indefensible. As we move forward, it shouldn't be especially contentious or partisan even to simply demand respect for our laws and our institutions. It wasn't too long ago when Democrats and Republicans could come together to reaffirm our commitment to voting rights and the Voting Rights Act. I urge the Supreme Court to reaffirm the doctrine of one person, one vote in this case. John Adams, our, one of our founding fathers, warned us about this day. He said, remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. But with that foreknowledge, we can be ever diligent, ever intentional, about preserving and investing in our unique expression of this institution. We must, over, we must challenge ourselves to aim higher, to do better. While I wish it wasn't necessary, I am so proud to be fighting some of the same fights that my great-great-grandfather did, among them justice and voting rights. I invite you, I implore you, to stand with me in reaffirming our dedication to the principles of democracy, to the rule of law, and to the inalienable rights of every adult American to have their voice heard and their vote counted. Ensuring a government by all of the people and for all of the people is essential to preserving the delicate fabric of our democracy. In this pivotal moment, let us remember that change is not only possible, it's inevitable when good people stand together. We are a resilient nation forged in the crucible of history and it is within our power to shape a brighter future. As we leave this hallowed ground, let us carry forth the torch of democracy, each step forward a beacon of hope. Let us engage with our communities, registering voters and igniting the flame of civic participation. Together we can and will reclaim the promise of a truly representative government. Thank you, and may the spirit of justice and unity guide our path forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Moore. Uh, up next,
We have a woman I'm sure many of our South Carolinians are familiar with. Uh, an author, an advocate, an organizer, ladies and gentlemen, a tireless champion for civil rights, Catherine Fleming Bruce. Wow, thank you everyone. Um, I'm so honored to be here with my fellow activists today as a representative of my state, supporting a decision by the Supreme Court that will ensure that voices of the people matter. We activists lift our voices daily, and this Supreme Court case has actually enabled a variety, a chorus of voices to be part of the dialogue. Through amicus briefs, friends of the court, once their standing is recognized, are able to participate so that the court will hear additional evidence and perspectives. And through my work, with the Atlantic Institute, a group committed to public dialogue, we're able to present and I'm able to share some of those perspectives with you now. Uh, we talked with a number of historians. Dan Carter, who's an eminent University of South Carolina uh, historian noted, you can't really look at what's going on right now, assume that the voting, the Civil Rights Act in 1964 made miraculous changes. We have cultural, historic patterns that run very deep. And we know that the law can change, but these patterns are still there that discriminate against African Americans. Public historian Louis Venters warned of the misuse and misapplication of history in order to advance unjust and spurious arguments. Vernon Burton, another historian, noted Things are not as they were, as an expression that was used in the Dred Scott decision, used again by Justice Roberts in Shelby versus Holder, and again by Justice Alito. And he says that fundamentally, we have to protect our right to citizenship, our right to vote, and to have an equal opportunity to have our votes count and if we don't, we find ourselves in a crisis of democracy. That's where we are today, folks, a crisis of democracy. We also had other voices, League of Women Voters, Geechee Gullah, um, Chamber of Commerce, um, and we had some institutions, Harvard Law School, that did an, a map where they looked at the algorithms to provide evidence that race was used and not other reasons. They were able to um, document that evidence and that went before the court. You also had other evidence that shows that when you crack our communities, <coughs> that means dividing up this, the, the Charleston County black voters. Their voices become weaker. It makes it harder for the community to find a voice Harders for organizers on the ground to get people out to elect our folks. So it's a harm. We're talking about a harm and we're documenting that harm. We also know from the League of Women Voters, they say that this is a continuation of the process of trying to dilute the voices of the people. Folks trying to drown out our voices drown out black voices so that we are not able to have a leading role. We are not able to make sure that our issues are addressed. So today, all of these voices here are telling us and asking us and challenging us, what is it that we want to do? What are we trying to build? If our end goal is democracy, one person, one vote, is gerrymandering the path that's gonna take us there? Is gerrymandering the path that's gonna take us there? No. no, no. So we stand here today from all parts of South Carolina and other states to say, the Supreme Court must ask itself the same question. Our state and our nation is watching. Thank you so much.
Thank you again, Ms. Bruce. Today, we are also going to be hearing from a man who works tire tirelessly to empower communities all across South Carolina. Uh, please help me welcome Mr. Charles Mann. Good morning, South Carolina and D.C. Good morning. My name is Charles Mann, and I'm with FC Counts. We do, uh, we did the last 2020 census, and we also did working with partners across the state, redistricting in 2021 and 22. We are here today to loudly protest racial gerrymandering by the state legislature of South Carolina. We are here today to support and loudly advocate for fair maps in South Carolina. We are here to say to our legislature, we want the right to select our congressional representatives of choice, not yours. As I thought about this day, I could not help but think about the segregation fight of 1895 in the state of South Carolina. It was, a, it was the white segregationist playbook in my home state. In 1895, then South Carolina Senator Ben Pitchfork Tillman, and he had that name for a reason, led an effort to rewrite the state's constitution. The main purpose of that rewrite of the constitution was to take away the voting rights of blacks. And it was also to disenfranchise black voters in the state of South Carolina. The effort was to undo the gains of reconstruction, both socially and politically, of the state's black population. And guess what? They succeeded. But not without an eloquent fight from six black delegates to that gathering, including that of Robert Smalls, and you just heard from his descendant. They put up a, 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 a magnificent fight. You see, Tillman believed the black people were ignorant, unmoral, lazy, illiterate, and corrupt. Now, any of you from South Carolina know that that description can be assigned to many people in our state legislature today. That's right. Tillman and his fellow segregationists wanted their state back. They wanted their power back. And they were willing to rewrite the state constitution to do it. It was a remarkable fight by those six black delegates at that constitutional convention, but they lost in the face of overwhelming segregationist opposition. So now, over 125 years later, and now, after the gains of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, we're here at this Supreme Court to eloquently fight for our voting rights of black South Carolinians again. We are again fighting for our voting rights as our state once again seeks to take away the voting rights of black South Carolina. They still have and are using the handbook provided by Ben Pitchfork Tillman. Discrimination folks and racism folks is still alive in the state of South Carolina. That is why we are here today. As our ancestors stood against white opposition in 1895, we must stand against opposition and racial gerrymandering in 2023. And this time, we will win. And we must win this fight in 2023 because in 2030, we will have another census and we will have another redistricting. And why must we win this fight? Because if South Carolina, ladies and gentlemen, continues to grow as it has, our state might be in position for another congressional seat in the House of Representatives. If that does happen, do we want it to be a racially gerrymandered seat 
no. not allowing us to vote for a candidate of, of our choice? No. I think the answer is a loud no. no. We must stop it here. We must stop it now. Mm -hmm. All for the future of our state and the future of black South Carolina. This court must rule that those 30,000 black voters moved to Congressional District 6 was an act of racial gerrymandering. And we must correct it now, and we must correct it today. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Rand. Uh, and now we are going to be hearing from a voting rights legal fellow from Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Adrian Spoto. today, legislatures across the South are trying their absolute hardest to stifle the voices of black voters and all voters of color. Rather than redistricting fairly, they carefully shape the district lines and they shuffle voters of color across those districts to keep them from being able to have a say in elections and elect candidates of their choice. But community keeps calling them on it. And the law says what they're doing is illegal. So what did these states do? Well, rather than doing the right thing, redistricting fairly, they just keep running right up to the US Supreme Court, asking it to overturn well-established law and undermine the voting power of communities of color. We've seen so much of this in the past years. And now South Carolina is here to try it again. In its most recent redistricting cycle, in 2022, South Carolina moved large numbers of black voters between Congressional District 1 and Congressional District 6. And these weren't just ordinary moves, they were moves carefully calculated to keep the share of black voters in Congressional District 1 low. South Carolina is asking the Supreme Court to throw out long-held standards for racial gerrymandering cases like this one. Under the U.S. Constitution, the court has long held that the use of race as a predominant factor in drawing a district is suspect. And in order to use race as a predominant factor, the state needs to have a compelling reason. South Carolina has no compelling reason here. The court has likewise long ruled that states can't racially discriminate and use partisanship as their excuse. States can't seek to achieve partisan goals through the illicit use of race, or by shifting black voters around to suit their ends. So South Carolina did exactly what long-standing law prohibits. It's an open and shut case. The court's decision should be clear. If the Supreme Court nonetheless rules in South Carolina's favor, they take the state up on its request to rewrite precedent, that ruling could have serious consequences for voting rights, emboldening legislatures across the South and across the country to use voters of color as pawns, shifting them into various districts to achieve partisan aims. And all of this will happen as states continue to seek out all sorts of other means of undermining minority voting rights, voter ID laws, polling place closures, and more. After this past redistricting cycle, nearly every Southern state has been sued for redistricting in ways that would harm silence and disenfranchise communities of color. Many of those cases are still going through the courts today. In many, the states have tried to hide behind partisanship as their excuse. And in a number of these cases, there are racial gerrymandering claims like the kind that the Supreme Court is considering here. Every case is unique and has to be looked at on its own facts. But courts deciding racial gerrymandering claims will look to what the Supreme Court says here. So the stakes are high. But precedent is on our side, and even more importantly, the people are too. Across the South, SCSJ and other pro-democracy groups are fighting for transparency in the redistricting process, for voting power equity for all voters, and for the basic fundamental truth that voters should be the ones selecting their elected officials, instead of elected officials being the ones to select their voters. We are so grateful to everyone here today and to every black South Carolinian who has fought tirelessly, 
tirelessly for your rights. We urge everyone here to keep on pushing for voting rights and fair redistricting across the South and across the nation. When we stand together, we can stop legislators from manipulating districts in their favor, and we can protect our multiracial democracy, the foundation that our communities and our rights stand on. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Adrian. Now, as you all know, uh, South Carolina NAACP is at the heart of this case. And today we are going to hear from none other than Vice President Marvin Neal. Everyone give him a round of applause. Good morning. Again, thank you for being here. I'd like to start this off with saying, black votes matters. Black votes matters. Yes, it does. Black boys matter. That's right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Marvin Neal, third vice president of South Carolina State Conference, NAACP. Today, I'm accompanied by the second vice president, Mr. Henry Griffin, who also testified during this hearing. First, I'd like to say thank you to the NAACP State Conference, my president, Brenda Murphy, Taiwan Scott, the resident of Hilton Head, the planners who led in the fight for the citizens of First District of Charleston, the First, Congre First Congressional District, for filing this lawsuit the NAACP teams of attorneys, Legal Defense Fund, ACLU, ACLU South Carolina, and Arno and Porter for the great work that has been done and the continuous work of the NAACP and their coalition partners. I would also like to say thank you to Southern Justice Coalition for their sponsorship and their support of this rally also. Thank you. In February, just some background. 2022, the NAACP State Conference claimed that Congressional District 1 is racially gerrymandering in violation of the 14th Amendment. After an eight-day trial, a three-judge panel in the federal court in South Carolina unanimously ruled in favor of the NAACP South Carolina State Conference this past January 2023. The three-judge panel ordered that the state of South Carolina draw a map that's complied with each U.S. Constitution. Despite the ruling, the pleas of the constituents to ratify the map and move on and ignore this responsibility to, to districts that so not unfairly harm black voters, the state legislators of South Carolina appealed this decision to the U.S. Supreme Court, which will hear this case with oral argument on this 11th day of October 2023. That's why we are here today. South Carolina legislators, they appealed a victory, a victory that was won in Charleston, a victory that was won in Charleston, a victory that was run in the federal court, a victory that will be won today. When we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. If the Supreme Court affirms the three panel judges' decision on today, which I know they will, the South Carolina General Assembly will have 30 days to draw a constitutionally complied map. Okay. Constitutionally complied map. Let's make it clear. Redistricting is not just about drawing a map. It's about representation and allocation of resources. Far too long, blacks and low-income communities in South Carolina have suffered because of unfair district lines and lack of investment in the areas like health care, infrastructure, education, and sustainability. The black voters of South Carolina and across this nation deserve voting maps that work to empower, not diminish the black vote. Not diminish the black vote. That's right. These maps are symbolic 
of a systematic attempt to break apart our communities and break down our voting power. Our voting power. The first congressional district of Charleston deserve and demand a fair map that provides equal representation to all voters and that, it at, that adhere to traditional redistricting principles such as keeping communities of interest whole like Charleston County. Those in power have preyed on our historical disadvantages and attempted to roll back the clock to time where we are not able to cast our ballots. Not today. Not today. Not today. That's right. We refuse to go back. That's right. That's right. We are here today to fight. That's what we're doing. We are fighting today. We are here today to win. That's right. And when we fight, we win. We win. When we fight, we win. we win. The NAACP South Carolina State Conference is determined to ensure that our voice are heard, both at this Supreme Court and on election day also. Voting is power. Black power is voting. Black power is civil rights. Black power is our right. When we fight, we win. We demand that this Supreme Court affirms our right to a non-discriminatory congressional map which allows us to exercise our constitution right to vote. 14th Amendment. Let's be clear. Democracy cannot work without the black vote. It cannot work. In order for democracy to work, for everyone, we must have equal access to the ballot booth. Voter suppression is nothing new for black communities. For over 150 years, we have been subject to widespread attacks aimed at preventing us from exercising our constitutional right to vote. Make no mistake, voter suppression efforts are stepped are steep in discrimination. The goal has always been to disenfranchise voters of color, of color. These legislators recognize that voting is power, because voting is power, and they want nothing more than to take that power away from the communities of color. This case is further evidence of the fact that the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, is committed to doing whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to ensure that every eligible voter have access to the ballot booth. That's our job. That's, right. That's why we're here today. That's, right. That's the purpose why we're here today. Purpose driven. I want to just quote. W.B. Du Bois. He once stated, let me close it. Now is not, not tomorrow. Now is the accepted time. Not tomorrow. Not some convenient season. Why are we here? It is today that our best work can be done. Let's do our best work today. When we fight, we win. we win. Black vote is black power. America cannot stand without the black vote. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you so much, Mr. Neal. Uh, now, please help me wel welcome to the stage President of the Gullah Geechee uh, Chamber of Commerce, Marilyn Hemingway. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marilyn Hemingway, and I am here as a representative of the Gullah Geechee community. Who are the Gullah Geechee? We are descendants of enslaved Africans brought to North, Carolina, North America, kidnapped to North America because of their knowledge of how to control the water and manage the land to grow the indigo rice, sea island cotton, and sugar cane. We are proud descendants of an evolutionary foundational culture that is foundational to African American culture, that is foundational to American culture. Yet, when our ancestors were brought here because of their knowledge, they received no compensation. 
and it is only since 2009 that minimum wage became $7.25 an hour. It is time for South Carolina to take their foot off our neck. It is time to end the hypocrisy of saying this is not race-based gerrymandering. This has real impact on economic uplift and opportunity in our community. So I wanna take a few minutes, just a few minutes to discuss with you the significance of, econ of voting rights and economic justice. These two concepts are not disparate, rather they are intricately linked forming the very foundation of a just and equitable society. And we are a living culture that evolved from an injustice. It is time to have justice. Let us take a moment to delve into the significance of voting rights and how they are integral to fostering economic growth. First and foremost, voting rights in the form of equitable maps are the cornerstone of any democratic society. They ensure that every citizen, regardless of their background, has an equal say in shaping their nation's destiny. In a democracy, each vote, vote is a voice, and every voice should be heard. When we protect and expand voting rights, we safeguard the fundamental principle that all individuals, regardless of race, gender, or socioeconomic status, have the power to influence the policies that impact their lives. Yet it is essential to acknowledge that voting rights have not always been universal or accessible to all. And that is apparent in how our state house wrote the first congressional district map. Throughout history, black communities have faced significant barriers when trying to exercise their right to vote. These barriers not only infringe upon the principles of democracy, but also hinder economic uplift. When a substantial portion of the population is disenfranchised, the potential for inclusive economic growth is stifled. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the first congressional district where more than 40% of enslaved Africans first set foot on this land. Our ancestors who evolved into our beloved Gullah Geechee community and where more than 80% of African Americans can trace their ancestral roots along the South Carolina coast. Therefore, where the first congressional district goes, therefore goes America. Ensuring equal access to voting rights, ensuring equitable maps is not just a moral imperative, it is also an economic imperative. When people can participate in the democratic process, they have a stronger voice in shaping policies that can drive economic uplift. This is particularly crucial for black communities as they often face the most significant economic disparities. Need I remind you that for 400 years, our ancestors were not paid for their knowledge and their labor. When these communities can vote, they can advocate for policies that address these disparities, creating a more level playing field for economic opportunity. Moreover, voting rights, equitable maps are intricately connected to the allocation of resources and investments in society. When every citizen has a say in elections, governments are more likely to invest in infrastructure, education, healthcare, and other essential services that promote economic development. Inclusivity in decision-making leads to policies that benefit everyone, not just the privileged few. Conversely, when voting rights are restricted or denied, economic development, economic justice can and will suffer. We've seen historical examples of societies where a small elite controlled political power leading to rampant inequality and a lack of economic progress for the majority. This must end. We demand that the South Carolina State House gives us equal maps. We demand that the, South, that the Supreme Court rule in favor of those who have been suppressed. In such cases, the concentration of power in the hands of a few stifles innovation, limits opportunities, and ultimately hampers economic growth. In recent times, the world has witnessed efforts to undermine voting rights in various democracies. 
it is even more egregious when it is race-based. These efforts often fueled by political motivations and have no doubt it is political to use race. Threaten not only the democratic fabric of societies, but also their economic prospects. Enough is enough. Our ancestors did not do the work that they did, that we are standing here today, continuing to fight for equitable maps for voting rights. As responsible citizens, we must stand up for the preservation, expansion of voting rights, and equitable drawing of district lines as they are essential for fostering an environment where economic development can thrive. Without us, there is no you. Voting rights and economic justice are not separate issues, but deeply intertwined elements of a flourishing democracy. When we protect and promote voting rights, when we protect our citizenry through fair and equitable redistricting, we ensure that every citizen has a voice in shaping their nation's economic policies. This in turn leads to more equitable and inclusive economic justice, benefiting all members of society. It is time to take your foot off our neck. So let us stand together to champion a fair and equitable first congressional district, for in doing so, we pave the way for a brighter, more prosperous future for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hemingway. Mother Nature herself, very excited for that. Uh, and now I want to welcome to the stage a Charleston community activist and mayoral candidate, everyone, Mika Gadsden. You know, there's, there's not much I can add. We've heard such amazing, fine points. So what I want to do is I want to punctuate much of what we all heard today, such, such strong and moving sentiments. I'm just gonna tell you more about my personal story because my personal story is the story of so many people who are here today. Um, I'm what you call a come ya, been ya hybrid. All right. um, I am the daughter of two Jim Crow refugees. My mother is native to Havelock, North Carolina. My father is native to Wadmalaw Island in South Carolina in Charleston County. They both had to leave the Jim Crow South and seek of better opportunities. They found each other, fell in love, and had me and my twin brother. Okay? <laughs> and I love sharing that story because what it does is it illustrates the struggle that so many people had to endure, right? I am proof of their perseverance. I am proof of their hard work. And my mayoral run is also proof of what can happen when people persevere and we're all strong, strong black people who have persevered through the, through the worst circumstances. It's important to talk about my mother, my father's humble beginnings also because they have imparted to me some important stories that, that tie directly to the moment where we are today. Not only were they denied economic opportunities that primarily uh, uh, led them to leave the South, but they also weren't seen as fully enfranchised citizens and their parents were not able to participate at a high level in their own democracy. My mother told me a story once about the first time she accompanied her mother to a desegregated bathroom, and also the first time she accompanied her mother to the polling place at an advanced age. That shows you how difficult it was to exist in the South. And it also tells you that a lot of what they endured, we're now facing right now. And it shouldn't be that way. We're still grappling with the vestiges of the Jim Crow era apartheid, and we need and we deserve fair maps. I also like to tell people that what we saw happen over the last, what, 10 years since the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, we saw this rapid, uh, we, saw, we saw voting rights being infringed upon in rapid succession in what we call Section 5 states. South Carolina is one of those Section 5 states. You see, the, pre the, the Supreme Court ruled about 10 years ago that we don't need voting right protections anymore because 
No one's going to disenfranchise black people. No one's going to redraw lines, uh, voting lines or district lines along racial boundaries. And we see that that, that is not true. Almost instantly, we saw states like Texas and South Carolina put in place voter ID laws. And let me tell you something about that voter ID law, because that really hit home in South Carolina. My father and my mother, but my father here in Charleston, uh, well, in Charleston, he was born at home to a midwife because you could not be delivered if you were black at a hospital. So what did that mean? That mean that midwife not only had to perform health care, she had to process your birth certificate. Now, thankfully, my dad's strong-willed midwife, who also changed his name <laughs> against my grandmother's will, she did process his, his paperwork and he has a birth certificate, but there are so many Charleston, so many South Carolinians who do not have that documentation. So when the gutting took place, they were no longer able to participate in their own democracy. This is real impact on people right now, people who are breathing right now, people who are living right now. We're seeing when you remove voting power from black citizens, we're seeing it play out in real time. South Carolina boasts the uh, eviction capital of the nation in North Charleston. There are area codes in the Richland County area where the most uh, diabetic amputations take place in the country. In Charleston, uh, to, oh, they, there you go, Richland County, that's right, right? In Charleston, the last census documented that we almost saw double digit decreases in black populations in Charleston County. This is all connected. And what this serves to do is neutralize the black vote. We are here today to demand that the Supreme Court uphold precedent and we are demanding fair maps. When I say one, what, what is it? one person, you say one vote. One person, one, one vote. vote. One person, one, one vote. vote. One person, one, one, person. Vote. one vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gasson. And let's give another round of applause for all of our speakers today. As we wrap up our program this morning, I want to welcome back up to the stage Ms. Emma Brooks to lead us all in one more song. I'm back again. <laughs> all that's been said and done, it really touched my heart. But I'm going to sing a song here that I think, I don't think everybody knows because as long as we put God first, everything is going to be all right. So what we got to do is we're going to trust in the Lord. I am going to trust in the Lord. Oh, I am going to trust in the Lord. I am going to trust in the Lord until I Oh, 
in the oh I am going to trust in the Lord I am going to trust in the Lord until I die I am going to trust in the Lord. I am going to trust in the Lord. I am going to trust in the Lord until I die. Um, if we could get the speakers to come up, line up behind me, uh, anybody who's working today, and then I'm going to lead us uh, for the first time ever in my life in a chant because it's a rally and we have to chant at a rally. Um, <laughs> so, give this. and if you, everybody will give our speakers and everyone who, who is here today one last round of applause. I want to first say we've got our signs listen to black voices protect black votes that's what's important here today that's what we want the supreme court to do um that's what we want all politicians to do um so if everyone will repeat after me when i say what do we want you guys say justice and when i say when do we want it you say now um so i'm gonna go ahead and get started what do we want justice when do we want it now what do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. One more time. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today.